Sports Illustrated does not report on United States senators, except Bill Bradley, who served 18 years in the Senate representing the great state of New Jersey before coming in second to Al Gore in the Democratic presidential primaries in the year 2000. Bill Bradley also served 10 years on the New York Knicks, winning two NBA championships. And before he joined the Knicks, Bill Bradley already had national fame as a member of the winning USA basketball team in the 1964 Olympics and as a basketball star at Princeton, where he won a Rhodes Scholarship that sent him off to England for two years of study when the Knicks wanted him to play professional basketball. Sports Illustrated reports, 35-year-old Bill Bradley wanted to be on the Senate Finance Committee. And when he walked into the Senate in January 1979, he got his wish. On one of his first days on the job, he sat at the end of a table as people testified about provisions of a portion of a multilateral trade negotiation known as the Tokyo Round. Bradley says now, I did not understand one word. It was sad. Fourteen years later, when I became the chief of staff of the Senate Finance Committee, Bill Bradley was the committee's recognized authority on international trade. My boss, the chairman of the committee, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a former Harvard professor, relied on Bill Bradley's expertise on international trade and taxation. It was a Senate policy version of the teamwork Bill Bradley mastered on the basketball court. The one tip I got about dealing with Senator Bradley before I met him was, don't say anything about basketball. That was the word in the Senate among people in the know. The idea was Bill Bradley worked hard as a senator and didn't want to be thought of as a basketball player in the Senate. The closest we ever came to discussing basketball was when Senator Moynihan was floor managing a major finance committee bill on the Senate floor and that was either going to pass or be defeated by one vote at two o'clock in the morning. And Bill Bradley came through the door, hustled over to where I was when Senator Moynihan was up there speaking and asked me, what's the play? It was one of those moments when your world spins. Here we are in the big game that we're going to win or lose by one point, time's running out. And the great Bill Bradley asks me, what's the play? So imagine my shock and delight when I saw Bill Bradley perform his one-man show in a New York theater, which is now streaming on Max, and the first thing he talked about was the one thing we had never talked about in the decades we've known each other. For those moments on the court when something extraordinary happened, When you saw in your mind's eye the past that could lead to the past, that could lead to the basket, before it happened. And then when it happened, say a perfectly executed backdoor play, or the two passes, or three quick passes to an open man on the other side of the court, there was a rush of joy, a feeling everything was in perfect balance, right there, on the court, with your teammates, before 19,500 people in the new Madison Square Garden, five times more than all the people living in Crystal City. William Warren Bradley grew up in the small town of Crystal City, Missouri, on the banks of the Mississippi River. He played for a Little League baseball team that was turned away from restaurants in Arkansas because the team included black players. It wasn't that much better 20 years later when he was playing for the Knicks, Bill Bradley saw up close the racism that his teammates faced. Bill Bradley was as good at legislating as he was at basketball. He got a hugely important tax reform bill passed when no one thought it was possible. But his most dramatic moment in the Senate was a moment I will never forget. And it was the moment when I was never prouder to say I work in the same place where Bill Bradley works. The most dramatic moment for me in the Senate came when an all-white California jury found four all-white L.A. police officers 
not guilty in the beating of an unarmed African-American man named Rodney King. Now, a neighbor caught the beating on videotape and the whole country had seen it. The officers hitting King with their batons 56 times in 81 seconds. So when the verdict came down, not guilty, the country erupted. And I went to the Senate floor to vent my own anger and let anybody know who was watching that somebody understood the injustice. So I was speaking and I spontaneously picked up a pen from my desk and I paused and without saying a word, I hit the podium 56 times in 81 seconds. descriptions of black Americans that have fueled hatred, discrimination, and fear throughout our history. I found my place. I stayed 10 years. We won two NBA championships. Standing at center court, with your fist raised in the air, Chills going up and down your spine, a, a smile frozen on your face, knowing you're the best in the world. Now, that's a thrill. <laughs> and it lasted about 48 hours. <laughs> then you had to go back to practice and try to do it all again the following year. The film is called Rolling Along, an American Story, produced by Spike Lee and Frank Oz, directed by Mike Tolan, and written by Bill Bradley, and it is now streaming on Max, where I have watched it twice and will be watching it again. Joining us now is the highest scorer in Princeton basketball history, Rhodes Scholar, New York Knicks star with two championship rings, United States Senator, devoted father, and losing presidential candidate Bill Bradley. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me on, Mark. You know, I, I be, I'm beginning with losing because in this story, there's very little losing, but there's a big loss in that presidential campaign that you had aimed at so carefully and modestly. And, um, and, it, and, and we see in this story that losing is a larger experience than winning. You just described winning as a kind of a 48-hour experience, uh, but the losing stayed with you for a while. Talk about that period. Well, um, I lost badly, and it went into a period of self-reflection where I began to think about who I was and what I wanted to do in the next part of my life, and uh, it was deeply enriching. Um, you know, it gave me a sense of myself in a way that I didn't have before. And it kind of guided me to follow the path that would be true to myself and pay attention to the wonders in the world. And um, it, it, it's hard to imagine this piece that you've done uh, without that loss shifting you into this more reflective mode. Well, I think that's right. I mean, uh, you know, this piece, uh, I didn't start out to do this piece. Somebody suggested to me it produced 72 plays on Broadway that after he heard me uh, talk about a few friends, I gave my papers to her Princeton, and they'd done oral history. And I stood up and talked about each one of them and told stories afterwards. He said, you know, it sounds a little bit like Hal Holbrook doing mm -hmm. Mark Twain. You ought to work something up. Mm -hmm. And so I did. It wasn't until that moment that I thought of doing this. And Spike Lee, big Knicks fan, comes on board. Frank Oz, great director, producer, Mike Tolan. And, and here had a we, lot of angels. You did. Along. You did. Here we are. Yeah. Um, there's a, there was a great moment um, the, in the <clears throat> Finance Committee conference room, which if, if you're watching a, a Senate hearing on C-SPAN, there's a door right behind the chairman. And through that door is a very big lovely, what you'd expect, conference room for the Senate Finance Committee. 
I was walking by in 1994 when you were doing an interview with the Washington Post about our legislative uh, environment, which looked pretty grim at the time. And you were you were giving all the accurate answers. Then the reporter kind of said, well, it looks pretty grim. And you said, I heard you say this, and I'm going to read it from the Washington Post where they printed it. You said, I'm in the optimism business. I can't afford to see only the dark side of things. And I heard that out of this year as I was going back in the committee room. I'm in the optimism business. And I realized I wasn't and I never had been. And it was the first moment I began to think of optimism as something other than naive. What, what allows you to, to hang on to optimism and in, in this environment, for example, that we're in now? Well, you know, I think we can learn a lot from what made our Nick team successful so many years ago. Like take responsibility for yourself, respect your fellow human being, disagree with them openly, honestly, civilly. Enjoy their humanity. And then what my grandmother said, never look down on somebody you don't understand. And so it starts with a set of values of what you believe about what is possible. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I did this film was to try to create some healing in the country, very divided. And yet I was so personal because I wanted to encourage other people to tell their stories. And if that happens, we find that there's a common humanity that we all share. And it's that common humanity that I'm betting on, not R&D. I'm betting on a common humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you, uh, when, when you look at the way governing is happening now, I mean, I look at it and I, I certainly don't recognize it from the time that we were there. And by the way, when, when we were there in the 1990s, we thought this is as hard as it gets. We thought it was as bad as yeah. it gets. Right? Money, money was doing it. Yeah, we thought it can't get worse than this. Right. And, and still you, we could do things. You could do things. You could get things done and you could you could do reasonable things with Bob Dole, the Republican uh, majority leader who was a member of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, and now, what do you see when you look at it? Well, it's not like we can't get things done. I mean, mm -hmm. President Biden's got a big infrastructure mm -hmm. bill done, uh, got a chips bill that will create thousands of manufacturing jobs. He's, you know, limiting how, what people have to pay on some of the drug costs. So we can get things done. It's just the atmosphere is poisoned in some way by partisanship and social media. And these, in some cases, the Republicans are not bad people. They just need more courage to stand up for what they truly believe, as opposed to just caving to whatever the pressure is at the moment. And I think Democrats have to reach out and get to know people as human beings. When Cory Booker, for example, went to the Senate for the first time, he asked me what he should do. I said, make five Republican friends, really friends. Mm -hmm. Once you do, they'll find out a way to help you. And sure enough, what happened, he introduced the foster care bill because he'd walked he visited with all these Republicans, Senator M. Hoff of uh, Oklahoma, very conservative. He saw that he had two adopted kids. So he said to him, would you co-sponsor the bill? He did. Got other Republicans. It's now the law of the land. So the point is, don't underestimate the human spirit. Don't underestimate our common humanity. Even in a world where it seems to be polluted or poisoned, that's not the case. That's not who we are as Americans. Uh, Joe Biden seemed to start his presidency with that Bradley optimism, and, and he got a lot of criticism for it. There were people who thought, oh, you don't understand. These aren't the Republicans you dealt with before. You're not going to get anything done. I privately believed Joe Biden wasn't going to get anything done. I was wrong. You were wrong. Uh, I was very wrong. Uh, and, and you were probably not surprised at what Joe Biden was able to accomplish. I was not surprised. I know who Joe Biden is. And I know what he believes about legislation, legislating. I know what he believes about the American people and his colleagues. And so sometimes what seems impossible, because we project the worst on a situation, mm -hmm. we just don't see the whole picture. It's like seeing only part of the court. To see the whole court, you got to see what's possible. And to me, that is the genius of real leadership. Yeah, it, that line you said about I'm in the optimism business, it, it was the first time I thought that I need, needed to widen my frame. I was always the worst case scenario guy, so I could always tell you how we were going to lose. I couldn't always tell you how we were going to win. Uh, and there's a line that you have in here in, in, in this piece that is uh, relevant to that. You say that you grew up uh, in that small town in Missouri, with, you, you use this phrase, protected from sophistication. 
Uh, and there I was growing up in Boston where we didn't think of ourselves as sophisticated, but the last thing we wanted to be was naive. So, you know, you, we were the first ones to figure out the negative side of everything. But you were protected from that. You were protected from sophistication. Right. There, there, there are two parts to that. Protected from sophistication and propelled by dreams. Those are two important things. Yes, I was uh, naive, you might say, but um, that's because I didn't hesitate to believe in the possibility of the human spirit. And I still don't um, hesitate to believe in that for our country, for our politics. And now we live in difficult times, no question about that. And um, our, the, the, president, the former president is certainly not helping things. But my view is, that's a, that's a small part of who we are as a people. And ultimately, it's a narrow part, and it's a part that drags us down to our worst selves as opposed to propels us forward to our best selves. Uh, we learn in your film that when you were 52 years old and your mother was in the final weeks of her life, uh, she said to you, uh, Bill, you've been a good boy. Uh, I just want to take this moment to say you've been a good senator. You've been good at everything you've ever done. It's an honor to know you, honor to have you here tonight. Well, I feel that about you, Lawrence. So it's an honor to be here with you and talk about this. Bill Bradley, thank you very much for everything you've done, every way you helped me when we were working together. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.